January 13th edition of PFTOT, just 12 days away from the return of PFT Live. And I literally can't wait. I'm not just saying that. I really can't wait to get back to the two hours per day to get myself back onto a somewhat normal schedule and to get back into the routine of hanging out with Chris Sims, Peter King, whoever else may be hosting the show with me to talk football as there's more football to talk about. But there's still plenty of football to talk about, even as we work our way through the final days of the annual slow time. I get to a point every July where I think, is it ever going to pick up again? And then I remember the calendar. Training camps open. Yes, it will pick up. Season approaches. Yes, it will pick up. Preseason games. It will pick up. A lot to come over the remainder of July and into August and then September. Boom, off we go with the 2022 season. Off we go today with PFTOT. I specifically waited to start this about 20 minutes or so before I have one of my twice weekly radio visits with the score in Chicago. So I won't just go on and on and on like I did yesterday. So this is going to be about 20 minutes, maybe 25. So let me get to it. First of all, Nikhil Harry traded by the New England Patriots to the Chicago Bears for a seventh round pick in 2024. Not a surprise. I'm surprised Harry lasted this long. And Mike Reese of ESPN.com floated the idea a couple of months ago that for Harry to have a chance to stay with the Patriots, he may have to move from receiver to tight end. I kind of regarded that as maybe a trial balloon or maybe an indication of the discussions that were happening behind the scene. Maybe Harry not interested. So instead, the Patriots offload his salary, a chunk of which was fully guaranteed. He was one of the last picks in round one that year. 2019 may have been the absolute last pick because if memory serves, and sometimes it does, sometimes it don't, the Patriots won the Super Bowl going into that draft. And look, this is another example of the failure of the Patriots to draft and or develop young receivers. We can call it a failure of drafting. That's easy. They took Nikhil Harry instead of A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf, Debo Samuel. How dumb were they to do that? Maybe if they had taken one of the other three guys, same thing would have happened. We don't know. It takes a unique mindset to make it work in New England. And just based on what I know about Bill Belichick from studying him over the years, how impatient he can be, it really wouldn't surprise me to know that they get out there on the practice field and you got some young receiver wet behind the ears, doesn't know where to line up. Get this guy the hell off there. I can't trust him. Let's get a veteran in here who knows how this offense works, who knows where he's supposed to be, who knows what he's supposed to do. Maybe there's a lack of patience with these young receivers. Or maybe they just screw up when they draft them. There were questions about Nikhil Harry. Now, Belichick thought he had the right pipeline with the Arizona State head coach to get the right information, but it just shows you it's not flawless. It's never flawless. And The Patriots, for all the things they've done right, they've had plenty of flaws over the years when it comes to drafting and developing young receivers. I'm not going to blame it only on bad decisions on draft day. It could be a failure to know how to develop a young talent the right way. That could be part of it. But Harry gets a chance now in Chicago where it's not like he's going to be relegated to third string. He's going to have an opportunity to get into the rotation. This is his chance. This is his moment. If he's ever going to turn his career around, he goes to a team that is in need of receivers with high-end ability or, for that matter, name recognition. It really isn't a depth chart chock full of stars. Velas Jones, third-round rookie, is 25 years old. He's going to be thrown right into the fray. Why? Look at the rest of the depth chart. No star receivers and an opportunity there to become the guy that Justin Fields, second-year quarterback, trusts. So we'll see how it works for Nikhil Harry. The Patriots avoid some guaranteed money. They get a seventh round pick in a couple of years. They could have just kept him for one more year and let him leave next year as a free agent and then pick up potentially a compensatory pick in 2024 based upon free agency gains and losses. And I don't want to go too next level on this, but their willingness to trade him now in exchange for a seventh round pick, just a seventh round pick in 2024 
could be an indication of where they think they are as it relates to the free agency cycle in 2023. Because if they plan to jump in with both feet like they did in 2021, then you don't need to worry about compensatory draft picks, free agency gains and losses. If you have more gains than losses, you don't get any picks. So again, it's possible that the Patriots did this move in part because they plan to go out and spend, they may be in a position to spend in 2023, making them not eligible for compensatory picks in 2024 anyway. So they get one in a roundabout way by trading Nikhil Harry. I saw some comments from Brian Erlacher, Hall of Fame linebacker, recently about players who may or may not have cognitive problems. And it really infuriated me how dismissive he was about players who think they may have an issue. There are plenty of players walking around who currently feel fine, who worry about every little thing that happens that makes them think maybe this is the beginning of a potentially inevitable decline. Where did I put my keys? Is this the start? What did I have for lunch yesterday? Is this the start? This focus, and I'm not saying it's an unjustified focus on chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE, a condition that can only be diagnosed in the brain tissue of deceased patients, that it is some sort of a, I don't want to say death sentence, but it's It is a promise slash threat of future cognitive problems to come. There are a lot of players who think that. And Erlacher's very dismissive quote that some guys, and I'm paraphrasing here, act like they have CTE so they can get in the effing lawsuit. That is so misguided and so disrespectful to what the players have fought for and received via the class action that was filed against the NFL more than a decade ago. And it was settled preliminarily in 2013 it took a few years to get it finally resolved and the bottom line is this any player who retired from the nfl before the class was certified the full class of former players who were part of the concussion litigation once that date hit any retired player became eligible at any point in their life to get compensation for a specific range of cognitive problems that may develop at some point in life, or if they die with CTE, their family, their estate gets the benefits. That was part of the deal the NFL did to get itself out of an ugly spot. The NFL may have won the concussion lawsuit. Look, there were plenty of defenses available to the league, some threshold defenses along the lines of whether or not players even have standing to sue because maybe they would have been required to go through the CBA. Now, for some years, there was no CBA. So you can't use that as a silver bullet for those players. But that was one of the threshold issues. Statute of limitations would have been an issue. The failure to join the NFL Players Association as a defendant would have been an issue because the NFLPA had a seat at the table of the mild traumatic brain injury committee, which consistently downplayed the risks long-term and short-term of head trauma. There were defenses. There were ways the NFL could have minimized liability. And look, at the end of the day, you put these guys on the stand and you get them to tell the truth. How many guys would have not played football if the NFL had been as transparent as they should have been about the long-term risks of head trauma? The NFL was concerned about a reckoning that when the reckoning came, it didn't change anything. Other than Chris Borland, it hasn't changed anything. Now, the NFL has done what it's had to do to make the game safer, but that's a product of making sure that kids will keep playing. That's about making changes at the top level of the sport, hoping they trickle down and hoping that mom and dad won't say, hey, football's too dangerous. Jay Glazer told a story years ago about being at his MMA gym out in Southern California in a A mom brought in her kid and said, I'd like him to get involved in this. I'm looking for something safer than football. And Jay's like, are you serious? Is this safer than football? But that's part of the PR battle the NFL was trying to wage. And one of the things the NFL wanted to avoid was discovery in the concussion litigation that would have resulted in people finding out what the league knew, when it knew it, how it covered up what it knew about head trauma, all those years of downplaying 
the idea that it might not be a good idea for you to put a helmet on and bash your head into someone else's helmet or into shoulder pads or into kneecaps or wherever. So the point is this, to allow the NFL to avoid what would have been a potentially ugly and protracted lawsuit, it would probably still be going on today, frankly. The league set up a fund that allows players no questions asked. They don't have to prove they got it from football. If they have a qualifying condition, they're entitled to pay. It's not like you just show up and you lie. Hey, I got some of that CTE. Give me my money. That's the impression Erlacher created. And it's dangerous because it makes people think that folks are running some sort of a scam, that it's not real, that it's all contrived or embellished or exaggerated. These guys have an absolute right to try to get benefits. They have an absolute right to worry about whether or not they do have some sort of a cognitive problem. And comments like Erlacher's, especially from someone who is a retired player who is eligible for the same damn benefits that he's complaining others may be trying to get when they don't deserve them. You have the absolute right to try. And the guardrails are in place to prevent players from getting benefits they don't deserve. But at the end of the day, look, it's just more money out of the NFL's pocket. It's an unlimited fund that the NFL agreed would be available. At one point, there was a cap. The cap went away in order to get the settlement approved. So it's not like Erlacher has to worry there's not going to be enough money for him if he develops cognitive issues, if all these other guys with phony claims take the money. That's not an issue. The money's going to be there. I just don't get it. And sometimes guys just say things without thinking. And the players out there who either do have cognitive issues or think they have cognitive issues or want to preserve the ability if they believe at some point they have a qualifying condition, you don't want to be looked down upon. You don't want to be shamed for trying to get what you deserve. So it just pissed me off. And look, I know he said, well, the guys who really deserve it are entitled to it, but there's guys out there act like they have CTE just because they want to be in the effing lawsuit. You're allowed to act like you have it. You're allowed to think you have it. I'm not saying you should submit a fraudulent claim, but if you think you have it, the money's there for you. It's part of the compensation that is available to you for all the years you gave your body and your brain and your health and your livelihood to football. And the system is there to separate the real claims from the fake claims. Again, you don't just walk in and say, give me my money. I have cognitive issues. You got to prove it. It's just unfortunate. And I hope it doesn't cause guys who think they're too proud, who don't want to be shamed, who don't want to be criticized to not pursue the benefits that they have earned and to which they are entitled. Daniel Snyder. I don't have much to add, but it's a developing story. And it really is bizarre to me. I've said before, I think the NFL is afraid of Daniel Snyder. I'm starting to think the House Oversight Committee is afraid of Daniel Snyder. Can we, can we quit dicking around with Daniel Snyder and just tell him it's time to testify? It's time for you to show up and answer questions? You know, right now, They've agreed on a date, but they haven't agreed on the terms. Is it going to be subject to subpoena or not subject to subpoena? And here's the big difference. If it's not subject to subpoena, Daniel Snyder can say, I will not answer any questions regarding any non-disclosure agreements that I'm a party to. See, the way these NDAs are written, you're prohibited from saying anything unless you are the subject of a duly issued and served subpoena. You can't create an NDA that short circuits the efforts of the justice system to get to the truth. That's the big difference here. You get him under subpoena, he can't hide behind an NDA. He wants to hide behind an NDA. He's not trying to protect someone else. He's trying to protect himself. He doesn't want to talk about the incident that gave rise to a claim of sexual harassment, allegedly on a plane back from the Country Music Awards in Las Vegas. He doesn't want to talk about that. He doesn't want to answer questions about that. So if he's not subpoenaed, he can say that's the subject of an NDA. I can't answer those questions. I'm a party to a contract that says I can't. If he's subpoenaed, it doesn't work. I just don't know why they're tiptoeing around the guy. There's only so much time left. By all appearances, the Republicans are going to win the House of Representatives in November. By January, this investigation ends. And I believe, it's my opinion, Snyder's trying to run out the clock with the help of his high-priced lawyers. Run out the clock and never have to testify because if he ever has to testify, there's no good way out of the maze for him. It's not gonna work. It will not happen. 
This is a hallmark of really rich, powerful person being required to submit to authority other than their own. They get put in that position and it becomes like Nathan Jessup, the character played by Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men. You just can't do it. You eventually snap. You are the one who gives the orders. You are the one who's in charge. Now, all of a sudden, you've got people telling you how to do things and what to do them. Daniel Snyder, the guy who insists on being called Mr. Snyder, you think he's going to handle it well? Do you think he's even going to realize the hole that he's dug for himself? I don't fault the lawyers for trying to run out the clock. That's the only way to keep their client out of a jackpot, in my opinion, is to make sure he never testifies. I'm just saying the House Oversight Committee, it's time. Quit playing games with this guy. Get him subpoenaed. Get him to testify. And if he's not going to play along, if he's going to continue to float around on his yacht or stay in Israel for six weeks or whatever the case may be, because he's supposedly going to be in Israel for all of July and into August, shame him. Make it clear. Because the NFL is not going to get on board this PR train and say anything that would make Daniel Snyder potentially look bad because they're afraid of him. Why is everybody afraid of this guy? Maybe I should be. <laughs> I'm trying not to get sued. I'm very careful to say in my opinion, these are all my opinions, these are not facts. In my opinion, everybody's afraid of this guy. Why are you so afraid of this guy? Let me move on. <laughs> Let's see if we have any questions. Uh, as I start to begin to consider maybe my own fears should be justified. I, I, I really, I just, I'm kidding. I, you either want to get to the truth or you don't. And it's all either politics and show and bluster, or you really want to get this guy under oath and find out what he knows, what he knew, what he did, what he didn't do, and how to ensure that there's proper accountability for, by all appearances, a decade or more of toxic workplace behavior and misconduct and harassment and other unsavory things within the Washington Commanders organization. All right, let's see what else we have here. PFT PM policy, considering the Patriots only got a seventh and it was obvious Nikhil Harry wasn't going to be on the roster this year. Did Bill Belichick do him wrong by keeping him for as long as he did because now he's missed the off season and uh, time with Justin Fields, et cetera, time with the playbook. I don't know that they did him wrong. I mean, they did what, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they were trying to work out a way to keep him. You know, he wanted to be traded last year. They worked out a way to keep him. Maybe they were trying to keep him around for training camp, preseason, and make a decision with the final roster cuts. Uh, it's always better to be involved in the offseason program, but it was good for him to get out when he did and to have the full extent of training camp in the preseason to get up to speed. So is it wrong? Is it right? I mean, the Browns did Baker Mayfield wrong. I, I guess the Patriots kind of did him wrong, but they had every right to do him wrong, if that makes any sense, and there's a chance it doesn't. PFTP and Posse wasn't Condoleezza Rice also once considered as a possible NFL commissioner. What are your memories on that? I, I've seen the name come up. There's all sorts of names that get floated as a potential commissioner for the NFL, but here's the reality. The NFL, for its entire 100 plus years of existence, has usually gone to some sort of an insider, somebody who knows the business, like Roger Goodell grew up in the business. Paul Tagliabue was an outside lawyer who understood the business, had worked with the NFL. The real question is, when Goodell leaves, are they going to have to tap into the CEO industry? Because there is an entire subset of high-end executives who go from company to company. It doesn't matter whether it's Pepsi or Disney or some other company. I'm trying to think of one. Oracle or you know, just completely different line of work, but it doesn't matter because in that job, the skill set is transferable. The skill set is management, delegation, vision. You have other people who understand the nuances of the business, and then you're a quick study, you figure it out. It's one of the skills you need to be a successful CEO. You go to a new business, you figure out very quickly what they do, how they do it, how they make whatever they make, whatever their services are, what their markets are, what their competitors are, what their threats are. It's all part of what a CEO does. That's what the NFL may eventually need. When you're talking about 65 million a year, that may be the skill set that the league requires. The problem is, I don't know CEO answers to a board of directors, but in a lot of cases, the CEO has a lot of sway in who gets on the board, makes it easier for the CEO to deal with the board if it's 
people that the CEO got on the board. But at the outset, the CEO is going to be dealing with a lot of strangers, unless the CEO is somebody that the board of directors already had a relationship with, then it makes it easy. But as it relates to the NFL, you've got a 32-person board of directors, the owners. You've got to keep them happy. That's the toughest part of the job. And as we know, one of the reasons Roger Goodell gets so much money, he runs interference for the owners. He takes the flack that they otherwise would take directly. All right, I'm running out of time. What else do we have here? NFL leads. Why do the independent media go along with calling a stadium by its sponsored name? They're not paying you guys anything. Why don't you just call it Steelers Stadium like you did with the Washington franchise? Plus, it sounds better. I may just keep calling Heinz Field Heinz Field. I may just do it. That's a good point. I'm not bound to say Acrisure. I may just call it Heinz Field. Why not? I, I, I think that the NFL expects the broadcast partners on the broadcast themselves to use the name of the stadium, but no one's required to do it. We can call it whatever we want. The place where the Steelers play, the field formerly known as Heinz. Maybe that's what I'll call it. The field formerly known as Heinz. All right, what else do we have here? Uh, another one from Neil Watch's PFT. One of the most jarring stadium name changes you can remember is Acrisure Stadium, the worst. I think that is the most jarring because Heinz Field was an organic, natural fit. It felt like Lambeau Field or Soldier Field, which, which aren't corporate naming rights situations. And now all of a sudden you go from one that feels normal and natural and perfect to one that feels artificial and fluorescent, not real, phony, fake. And as I said yesterday, the Steelers are making more than enough money to ignore your complaints about their new stadium naming rights partner. Um, all right, I got to wrap this up. I'm looking for one other one that maybe I can get to that won't take that much time. Here's another one on the Steelers naming rights situation. Rooney announced he was excited to partner with Acrisure, but the Rooney family doesn't own the stadium. It's owned by the Sports and Exhibition Authority of Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. How did that deal work and why is Rooney taking credit? I think it may be in the lease that the Steelers get the money for the naming rights. I mean, this was tied to the Steelers, not Pitt, which plays there. I think the Steelers get the money from the naming rights. I think that's part of their lease. I think I, that's why they're acting this way. That's why they're taking full ownership of this deal. It's their deal to do, not Heinz Field or the field formerly known as Heinz. Uh, Josh Ramos, which show format do you like better? The purely unscripted PFTOT you're doing today or the highly produced PFT Live, PFT PM? PFT Live and PFT PM are, are not highly produced. Th there's a flow, there are topics, but we talk about whatever we want to talk about within the confines of those topics. Now, for this, I just pick my own topics and I just go. But PFT Live is not highly produced. Football Night in America is highly produced because it has to be, because there's only so much time available. There are certain things that must be done. You got to get all the highlights in. You can't get off on some tangent that takes up half the show. Those of you who watch PFT Live know that a lot of times our first topic of the day will consume half the show, and then we got to motor through everything else. So uh, that show is not highly produced, and obviously this is as, as lowly produced as it possibly could be. All right, if I didn't get to one of your questions, ask it tomorrow. There was one other one that caught my eye. Um, Nate watches PFT. Daily listener and recent law school graduate in Massachusetts made a Twitter just to reach out. I would love to hear about your experience taking the bar exam and as an early attorney. Any advice I take the exam in two weeks? Playmakers is my first read when I'm done. All right, Neil, Neil Nate, Nate watches PFT. And I got to make this quick because I got a phone call coming soon. Quit listening, quit tweeting, focus exclusively on your preparation for the bar exam. This is your life for the next two weeks and get yourself practice questions. There are courses out there. There are, I can't remember the name of the course. It's been a long time, but the practice questions are very accurate. They hire people to go take the test, memorize questions, and then leave the testing room when it's over and call them in so they, they understand what the rhythm, what the flow is. They don't make brand new questions for every time they do the test. So the, the leading publications out there that have the sample questions, the sample, that's what you need to study. That's what you need to do over and over and over and over and over again, and you'll be fine. But quit listening to us until after you take the bar exam. I mean, I know you, you need a little balance, but you need to go all in at some point and get yourself ready for this thing, your, your future career 
is riding on it. And maybe one of these days you'll get to escape your future career and not have to worry about that stuff anymore. Trust me, that's one of the most rewarding developments that I've ever had professionally. I now get to sit around all day long and do a bunch of stuff that matters to absolutely no one, but nevertheless keeps the light as, lights on. Time to turn the lights off. We'll see you tomorrow for another edition of PFTOT. Check us out around the clock at profootballtalk.com. Thanks as always for some of your time. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.